you're welcome to. Sure, thank you. Can everyone see? Seems yes. so. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bradley, and to Giselle and Shelley and the whole Bahamas National Trust team for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, I was hoping to be there in person, but of course that's not happening. So I'm really grateful to be um, a part of this virtual meeting. Just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Penny Langhammer. I'm Executive Vice President for Science and Strategy at Global Wildlife Conservation. And I've been working on key biodiversity areas for almost 20 years now in one capacity or another. Um, so with that, I'll just kick off and um, start with some reflections. As everyone working in this field knows, biodiversity loss is occurring at an alarming rate across the world's terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environments. And we have many species and ecosystems that are, being, that are at risk of being lost forever. The biggest threat to biodiversity around the world is of course habitat destruction and safeguarding critical habitats is therefore at the heart of strategies for conservation. Indeed, stemming the accelerating loss of biodiversity will require a global commitment to slowing and stopping the degradation, destruction and overexploitation of habitats by conserving the most important places for biodiversity on earth. Back in 2010, the governments of the world through the Convention on Biological Diversity agreed to conserve at least 17% of the inland parts of the earth and 10% of the coastal and marine areas to and to focus on areas of particular importance for biodiversity. However, at that time, there was no agreement on the location of these important places where biodiversity value needs to be safeguarded against continuing development and exploitation of natural resources. And key biodiversity areas respond to this need. The definition of key biodiversity areas, they are sites that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And they are identified by national constituencies using globally standardized criteria. KBAs have delineated boundaries and should be manageable as a single unit. So they are different from landscapes or seascapes or even large hotspot areas, so they're sites. And they provide decision makers with an improved understanding of why a particular area is important for biodiversity. Why won't it let me advance my slides? Okay. And that's because they are identified using a globally standardized science-based approach outlined in the global KBA standard. The general approach is similar to that used in the IUCN Red List. The KBA standard contains the definitions, criteria, and quantitative thresholds to ensure that KBAs are identified in an objective, repeatable, and transparent way. The KBA standard builds on and harmonizes existing approaches to the identification of important sites for biodiversity, of which there's a long history, including important bird and biodiversity areas, Alliance for Zero Extinction sites, important sites for freshwater biodiversity, and many others. The standard was developed in response to a request from IUCN members <clears throat> back in 2004 at the World Conservation Congress. And the request was to consolidate the criteria for identifying sites as KBAs and to ensure that the criteria apply to all of biodiversity. The standard was adopted by IUCN Council in 2016 following a four year global consultation process to develop it, which was led by the SSC WCPA Joint Task Force on Biodiversity and protected areas, which I co-chair with Dr. Stephen Woodley. Most previous approaches to identifying important sites have been species-based. The KBA standard goes beyond that to include both species and ecosystem-based criteria. Genetic diversity is also addressed under some of the species-based criteria. And collectively, the criteria aim to capture the different ways in which a site can be important for the, pers the global persistence of biodiversity because it holds threatened or geographically restricted biodiversity, has outstanding ecological integrity, maintains biological processes, or is shown to be highly irreplaceable through quantitative analysis. There are 11 criteria for identifying KBAs, which are grouped into five high-level criteria shown here, A through E 
For example, under threatened biodiversity, there's a criterion for threatened species as well as for threatened ecosystems. Anyone can identify a site as a KBA. Um, KBA national coordination groups are being established around the world, which helps ensure that KBAs can be identified in a coordinated way across taxonomic groups and ecosystems. And then ideally to be monitored and conserved by those um, NCG members and their partners. National coordination groups, as you can see here, have been established in, in a number of countries within Africa, as well as Canada and Australia. And we've got increasing interest from other parts of the world illustrated in green. These groups typically include the KBA partners, which I'll come to in a minute, working in a particular country, other conservation organizations, um, universities, herbaria, museums, holders of data on biodiversity, government agencies, sometimes the private sector, and indigenous people's representatives. The KBA partnership provides support in various ways, including with fundraising, training, and technical support, and promotion of KBAs at the international level. United by the global KBA standard, many of the world's leading environmental organizations, nature conservation organizations formed a KBA partnership in 2016 to support implementation of the, of the global standard. This partnership is working to identify, document, and monitor KBAs and to communicate, promote, and position this information to ensure these important sites are adequately safeguarded. Each of these partners has made a commitment to supporting this work in at least 20 countries and investing at least a million dollars every five years. Information on the location of KBAs and the biodiversity they can contain is made publicly available through the World Database of Key Biodiversity Areas, which is managed by BirdLife International on behalf of the KBA partnership. KBAs provide an effective bridge between assessment processes and conservation planning and are an important step toward conservation action. KBA data in the World Database of KBAs are being used in many different ways at global, national, local levels to influence conservation decisions, sustainable development um, around the world. For example, national governments use KBA data to support conservation priority setting, strategic expansion of protected area networks, and the implementation of environmental, international environmental agreements including commitments to expand protected area coverage under the Aichi Target 11 of the CBD, as well as commitments to prevent species extinction under Aichi Target 12. Conserving KBAs is essential to help countries meet the sustainable development goals and protected area coverage of KBAs is an official indicator for three targets in two of the sustainable development goals, as well as for Aichi Target 11. In many cases, KBAs are already well conserved where additional management is required to secure the persistence of biodiversity at the site. There are often many management options available. The important thing is that the identification and delineation of a KBA carries no management prescription. So they aren't a type of protected area, even though many of them often are. Many of them won't be able to be conserved for various reasons through formal protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures will be needed. That said, KBAs um, have been and are being used to guide establishment of protected areas under international agreements, such as Ramsar, World Heritage. Efforts by national governments, such as in Myanmar pictured here and also in Canada and elsewhere, to, who are trying to meet um, Aichi Target 11, and by conservation organizations that are working to establish private or community-based conservation areas or support the establishment of government protected areas. Much of the work to conserve KBAs, of course, is done by local communities. KBAs provide opportunities for local and indigenous communities for employment, recognition, economic investment, societal mobilization, and civic pride. Here are some examples of site support groups that have been established to conserve KBAs in different parts of the world. Data on KBAs are also being used by donors, conservation funding agencies to guide investment in conservation. For example, in the Jeff 7 Biodiversity Strategies, the Global Environment Facility, new protected areas established with Jeff's support must be globally significant 
as defined by the KBA standard. The Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund has been using KBAs as a lens for selecting geographic priorities nearly since its inception. And globally to date, CPF has supported the strengthened management of over 47 million hectares of key biodiversity areas around the world. Information on KBAs is also channeled to international financing agencies, such as the International Finance Corporation. These agencies use this information in their safeguard policies and investment decisions, providing strong incentives to companies seeking international financing to avoid environmentally destructive impacts in these areas. KBAs are recognized by the IFC and um, the Equator Principles Banks as likely critical habitat, triggering a higher level of safeguard. Information on KBAs is also channeled to other um, companies, including large natural resource-based corporations through the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, or IBAT. So they can take this information into account early in project exploration and development phase and avoid negative impacts on KBAs where possible. Guidelines on business and KBAs have been, to develop, have been developed to help businesses engage in KBA conservation and minimize their impacts on these globally important sites. So switching gears to the Bahamas, um, IBAs, or the Important Bird and Biodiversity Areas, the avian subset of KBAs, were first identified in the Bahamas in 2002-2003 by Bahamas National Trust and BirdLife International. Through the ecosystem profiling process of CEPF, KBAs were identified for additional taxonomic groups in 2010 under earlier criteria. And through the recent update of the CEPF ecosystem profile in 2019, which many of you may have been involved in, an initial assessment of the KBAs against the global standard was made, but the work couldn't be fully completed due to lack of time and resources. So many sites lack sufficient data to demonstrate that they meet the, the criteria in the global standard. Also, there are a number of globally threatened and geographically restricted species that have not been considered at all. They fell through the cracks and no work has yet been done for specifically for marine. So at present, there are 50 KBAs currently recognized in the Bahamas. With support from Global Wildlife Conservation, Bahamas National Trust is now leading a reassessment and update of KBAs in the Bahamas to ensure that they meet the global KBA standard, essentially picking up where the CEPF process left off and getting it over the finish line. And to identify new sites as needed, compile the required documentations to ensure these sites can be included in the world database of KBAs. The team has decided to prioritize the threatened endemics and near endemics pictured here, or listed here, since the global persistence of these species depends entirely or almost entirely on conservation actions taken within the Bahamas. Over time, the team will work to ensure that all threatened and geographically restricted species and those that aggregate in globally significant numbers are evaluated, as well as ecosystems, if ecosystems are, are assessed against the red list of ecosystems. So in this table, those species that are showing in bold are currently recognized as KBA trigger species, not necessarily at all the sites where they occur or could trigger the criteria, but they are listed as a trigger species for at least one KBA, whereas all the species that are not in bold um, have not yet been considered. There are many threatened endemics or near endemics that haven't yet been considered, including the species of sedge, which occurs only here on the western edge of Grand Bahama, completely on private land, I believe. So why are KBAs important for the Bahamas? Well, many of the K Bahamas KBAs are already protected areas, of course, but there are also KBAs that do not have any form of local protection. KBAs can guide the strategic expansion of the protected area network on land and in the sea and identify areas where different approaches such as working with private landholders will be needed. KBAs can identify sites requiring strengthened management and monitoring for species that are not considered in existing management plans. There are probably a number of species um, on that list that I showed on the previous slide that should be considered in a management plan for a protected KBA but perhaps are not. They can also flag areas that should trigger higher environmental safeguards by the private sector, 
which of course um, development pressures in the Bahamas are a significant threat in some areas. And raising the profile of these, the global profile of these sites will also ideally trigger greater economic and or conservation investment. For example, global wildlife conservation is interested in helping to, to protect some of these KBAs with critically endangered or endangered endemics that are not yet protected. The Bahamas is fully committed, of course, to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and identifying and conserving KBAs is a critical step toward achieving these goals. And ultimately, safeguarding the value of KBAs helps to maximize the long-term chances of survival for species and ecosystems. Identifying and safeguarding these areas is among the most vital and transformative approaches available to re reverse the loss of biodiversity and alter our current business as usual trajectory toward mass extinction and e ecosystem collapse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Penny. So I failed to mention that one of our presenters Graham Reynolds is out sick today. He was unable to join us. And so we're going to move on to hear from Dr. I mean, pardon me, Jean, Janine Altafi, who is going to speak about Bahama Orioles on the island of Andros. Uh, in addition, I wanted to mention that you can submit questions through the chat box uh, and we will address them at the end of the session. Um, and so just continue to submit your, your questions as we go along. Uh, and thanks for participating. Uh, Janine, are you ready to, to begin? I am ready. Um, thank you, Bradley, for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Special thanks, of course, to BNT, Giselle, Shelley, Bradley. I know you guys have been working really hard. Um, and I am actually really excited to share this piece of what I've been working on with the Bahama Oriole Project and UMBC. So um, Penny just got done talking about key biodiversity areas. And I'm going to kind of broaden that um, you know, just to focus on uh, critically endangered species, the Bahama Oriole, and um, remote sensing of their habitat. So remote sensing of Andros. And all right, so let me talk real quickly. Let me see. Sorry, I'm just having trouble moving my, okay. Um, all right, so some background on Andros. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar, but this is an archipelago just west of New Providence Island. And part of what makes it so special is how much pristine habitat there is. So road access and development is largely restricted to the eastern side of the island here. Um, so much of the central and western portions of the island are virtually untouched by humans. And this is great for the wildlife of Andros, but it makes monitoring these species and habitats quite difficult. And unfortunately, these habitats and the wildlife within are facing environmental threats that are only expected to increase in severity. So two of these being sea level rise and hurricanes. And um, those of you that may have been to Andros may notice that much of the islands are only just above sea level. So very low and very vulnerable to even a slight rise in sea level. And as many of you know, and as Bradley talked a lot about last week, um, hurricanes are not only occurring at higher frequencies, but they're also getting stronger. So the concern is that saltwater inundation from both sea level rise and hurricanes may threaten many habitats across Andros. And this really highlights the importance of a means to monitor these habitats and the species within. So this becomes really critical though when we consider um, you know, endangered species, particularly endemic endangered species such as the Bahama Oriole. Now, the known historic range of the species included the islands of Abaco and Andros. However, the species became locally extinct on Abaco sometime during the 1990s, making Andros the extent of the Bahama Orioles range. Now, given that Andros is the last remaining refuge for this species, it is crucial that we're able to monitor populations and knowing how the Orioles preferred habitats are distributed across the landscape is really kind of a fundamental first step to conservation management. Um, so what about the Bahama Oriole habitat on Andros? What do we know about it so far? Um, while this Oriole was once thought to almost exclusively use coconut palms in developed and residential areas, we now have evidence that Orioles are nesting maybe extensively in the pine forest. So here we have BNT's chief science officer, Scott Johnson. He's pointing up to an Oriole nest he found in this tall thatch palm while surveying Blue Holes National Park on North Andros. Um, and for those of you that have never seen an Oriole nest, this is kind of a typical 
um, nests you'd see hanging from the underside of a palm frond. So in the pine forest, they're using these small, tall thatch palms to nest, and also sometimes even in the upper canopy of the pine trees itself. Um, moreover, we also have evidence that nesting success is actually higher in the pine forest. So an undergraduate researcher with UMBC and the Bahama Oriole Project uh, looked at rates of shiny, bird, shiny cowbird parasitism on Bahama Oriole nests. And she found that most of the nests in developed areas uh, were in fact parasitized. So about 75% of the nests in developed er areas were parasitized by cowbirds. Whereas we found no evidence of cowbird parasitism in the pine forest. So this is evidence that suggests the pine forest provides a very important and high quality nesting habitat. And it's really this new understanding that warranted a need to better understand the distribution and extent of pine forests across Andros. So that brings me to the objectives here. Um, given the challenges I mentioned earlier, we wanted to use remote sensing to develop a land classification map and to predict the distribution of habitats on Andros with a particular focus on the pine forest. So just some background on remote sensing. Um, remote sensing to monitor biodiversity is nothing new. Uh, researchers have been using this technology for well over 50 years now. Um, of course, the technology has improved from aerial photography to satellite imagery that captures essentially electromagnetic radiation reflected off of Earth's features. And that allows us to characterize these features in more detail. So remember, you and I can only really see in this green, blue, and red spectrum. Um, but the satellite sensors are able to detect a much larger range of electromagnetic radiation. And this enhances our ability to accurately identify features from space. And really it's this technology that allows us to efficiently monitor habitats and biodiversity remotely. Um, so for this project in particular, we use data captured by the sensors on the Landsat 8 satellite. These data come in several layers or bands are described here. Um, each capturing reflectance of electromagnetic radiation at different wavelengths. And the different features or habitats each have a different spectral signature. That's the term we sort of use. And it's this spectral signature that allows a computer or model to try and identify that feature. So that's essentially how it's worked. It's based off of this spectral signature. So down here in the right, um, this graph is showing how different features might look different spectrally. So you've got dry bare soil in orange, green vegetation here in green, and then water down here in blue. All right, so what we did then was we surveyed as much of Andros as we possibly could, given time and money and accessibility. Um, and we characterized and georeferenced distinct habitats. And then we then used these data to train a random forest decision tree model using the Landsat 8 data as predictor variables. And we did most of this in R, where we ultimately delineated nine terrestrial habitats or classes. We also um, classified the two water classes, deep water and shallow water, but I'm not really gonna talk about those since I'm particularly interested in the Bahama Oriole and Pine Forest. Um, but real quickly, I'll run through what these habitats are just to give you a sense of the landscape on Andros. Uh, first, we defined Caribbean pine as being fairly open pine forests, generally ranging from about seven meters or so up until about 20. The understory of the pine forest uh, is fairly open and generally consists of thatch palm and broadleaf plants, um, probably the most prominent being uh, poison wood, which some of you may be familiar with, unfortunately. Um, all right, let's move on to broadleaf coppice. Um, these are evergreen forests. They can be very, very dense. And unlike pine, they don't tend to be dominated by any one particular species. Um, some of the typical species you'll see include gamalame, pigeon plum, maybe five finger, and of course, poison wood again. Um, now, while I did say the, the coppice is often very dense, um, some places though, it can be mature with a closed canopy and an open understory. And this can be actually quite nice. Um, if you've never been to South Andros or if you do go, the trails around the blue holes um, near Congo town are really pretty amazing. You can see all sorts of epiphytes and bromeliads in these mature coppice forests. It's really quite nice. Um, but let's move on now to woody shrubland. Um, this category is actually pretty broad and it can refer to any mix of low scattered pine native palms and broadleaf vegetation. So this image here is an example from Red Base. It's actually the only settlement on the west coast of Andros. And here you can see what I think appears to be sable palmetto in the forefront with some scattered pine in the background and then some remnants of broadleaf vegetation. Um, this looks to me like it might be casuarina. I'm not 100% positive. Um, but anyway, I do want to caution though that the term shrubland may be somewhat of a misnomer as these habitats are frequently flooded and they often have an understory dominated by stall grass, so uh, that you can see here in the forefront. 
All right, another type of shrubby wetland is the grassy shrubland, which is largely dominated by native sawgrass, so you can see here in the forefront. And then just quickly, I'll point out the woody shrubland habitat there in the background. And moving on to mangrove. Um, mangrove habitats on Andros, um, at least Eastern Andros, as I wasn't really able to travel far west, um, but they mostly appear very low. And by low, I mean only one or two meters and often less than one meter. So this picture here is from Bowen Sound in center, central Andros. And it's pretty typical of most of what I've seen, at least on each Eastern Andros with regards to mangrove. And I'm not going to focus on these last four habitats too much as they're either self-explanatory, like in the case of agriculture and developed, or not really relevant to the Orioles. So uh, mudflat and sand, I'm just going to skip over those. And I will now show you the map. So here you have it. It's a land classification map delineating nine terrestrial habitats across Andros. I've excluded the water categories here just for simpl simplicity purposes. Um, and I know this is a lot to look at, so let's focus in a little bit um, on this portion of North Andros. And here we can see that the distribution of habitats more or less reflects elevation, with broadleaf coppice being largely restricted to the higher elevated areas in the east, um, fading into pine forest, which is actually quite extensive, and then eventually grading into those shrubland and barren habitats as you head west and lower in elevation, and finally into sand and mangrove along the coast. Now, if we look at agriculture and developed classes here, we can see that the map did a pretty good job at delineating these areas on North Andros. So here you can see pretty clearly Queens Highway, uh, Nichols Town up here with Mastic Point, San Andros Airport right here. Um, and the agriculture also is pretty clearly delineated. And actually, in fact, what I'm showing you here, this gold represents most of the agriculture across all of Andros. And um, so this largely includes the Bahamas Agricultural Research Center and BAMSI, or the Bahamas Agriculture and Marine Science Institute. Um, so, but a map is only as good as its accuracy. So let's look at that. I'd say we're pretty happy with an overall accuracy of 89%. That essentially means we were right 89% of the time, so that's not too bad. Um, of course, different classes varied in their degrees of accuracy, but what I want you to notice is that Caribbean pine category had the highest mean class accuracy of all of the terrestrial categories of 92%. Um, so that means for our purposes with the Bahama Oriole and pine habitats, we can be pretty confident that if our map says it's pine, it really is pine. Uh, now that being said though, it's my responsibility to caution users when considering some of the other less extensive categories. So there is a lot of pine that's easily accessible uh, thanks to a network of old logging roads on North Andrews in particular. So we had better training data for this category. In particular, our model had difficulty with this woody shrubland category. And we're not entirely sure, but we attribute most of this uncertainty to a relatively low amount of training data. Um, remember these habitats were difficult to access as well as the fact that this category is quite broad and the spectral signature is similar to that of pine and coppice. Um, remember this habitat refers to any degree of sparse, low scattered pine, broadleaf or palms. So our model did have a little bit of trouble with this one. Okay, so I've disclosed our strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the map. Now let's look at the different classes and the different islands in some more detail. So feel free to look at the table or the pie chart, but really what I wanna show is that Caribbean pine is the largest of the terrestrial habitats, followed by that mudflat category. And agriculture and developed are actually very, very small, making up less than 1% of the total land area, in fact. And one thing when we notice when analyzing the map in more detail across islands is that the proportions of habitats appear to be similar across the three main islands in that pine is the largest followed by mud flat with agriculture developed being the smallest of the habitats. Um, and here I've given you for the pine category, average patch size. And so here we can see that mangrove key actually had the largest average patch size at 700 meters squared um, followed by North Andros and then South Andros. But I wanna point out, this is just based off of raw averages. And when we look at the data differently, we see a much more detailed picture. So specifically, we wanted to look at the distribution of patch size. Uh, in other words, how much of the total pine area is present as patches that are small versus patches that are large. And since we're specifically concerned with the Palm Oriole, we're using a small patch cutoff of about 20 hectares or 0.2 kilometers squared. Uh, this number is based off of some preliminary data from radio telemetry that estimated territory size during the breeding season in 2019. Um, but so anything over that we cautiously assume could sustain uh, at least one breeding pair. Um, and so what this histogram is showing then is that on North Andros, 
over 50% of the total pine habitat area is actually locked up in these small patches that are less than 20 hectares. Whereas mangrove key, on the other hand, um, this is mangrove key here, um, over 90% of the total pine area is found as larger patches that are over 20 hectares. And so South Andros is sort of somewhere in the middle, but notice that South Andros is lacking um, any large patches, sorry, gotta find my mouse, any large patches um, over 25, about 2,500 hectares. But small patches might not definitively be a bad thing, especially when we take into consideration the surrounding landscape. So here we're showing the distribution of patches based off of distance to the nearest pine patch. Um, so we can see that for all three islands, about 75% of the patches are actually pretty close to a neighboring patch of pine. So less than 100 meters or about the length of an American football field. Um, this is pretty close for bird. And this suggests that there may be decent connectivity among patches, allowing Orioles to utilize multiple small patches in the absence of maybe one or a few very large patches. All right, I better wrap up. Um, so I'll quickly summarize. Uh, we've successfully delineated 11 habitat classes, so nine terrestrial and two water classes. And with regards to the palm Oriole, we were mostly concerned with pine, which we were able to map with a high accuracy of 92%. And among several landscape and patch characteristics, we calculated total area of pine as well as distance to the nearest neighbor. Um, remember a measure of connectivity, which I just showed you. Um, but essentially the takeaway is that with regards to the Bahama Oriole and pine habitats, North Andros and Mangrove Key provide the most contiguous pine habitat. All right, so what comes next? There are many different ways in which someone interested in researching biodiversity or natural resources on Andros could use this map. I uh, given my email address at the end of this presentation, so feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to send you the map um, and any other information you might need. Um, but of course, I'm focused on the Bahama Oriole, so the next step is to determine exactly how much of the pine forest is actually currently protected. So I've outlined here the three terrestrial parks on Andros, Blue Holes National Park over here, the Crab Replenishment Zone, and uh, the massive Westside National Park. Um, and essentially, we want to see how much pine is protected under these parks. And next, we wanna use this map in a population estimate of abundance using previously collected point count data that we have. So doing so will allow us to provide a more recent and a more accurate estimate of the Orioles global population. And then lastly, we do plan to use this map as a predictor variable in a species distribution model. So really all of these applications are intended to better and help us better understand the distribution of habitats important to the Bahama Oriole while also allowing us to monitor future change. So that's the important part, monitor future change as we continue to face the threats associated with climate change. And then, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank all of the people who actually did most of the grunt work on the ground. So Michael, Jennifer, Dr. Three, as well as all of the support of the Omlin Lab at UNBC. And of course, special thanks to Birds Caribbean for providing funding for two consecutive years, as well as the Florida Ornithological Society, American Bird Conservancy, and the National Science Foundation. Um, a very, 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 very special thanks to BNT for being our partner and supporting and facilitating this very important work. And lastly, I have to send a shout out to the locals on Andros who are just consistently helpful and engaging and really have made my experience working on Andros uh, pretty awesome. So thank you. Thank you, Janine. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have another presentation. We're going to be focused on be delivered by Dr. Frank Rivera Milan, uh, and he's going to be talking about the Bahama Pirates and their responses to her. Frank, are you prepared? Are, uh, are yes, you um, but I cannot hear you very well. Can you hear me well? Oh, I can hear you very well. Um, and... Okay, so and can you see my presentation well? Yes, I can see that as well. All right, so let's go. Um, well, hello everybody, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bradley, Giselle, um, Shelly, Scott. I mean, all the people of BNT for the support given um, throughout the years working with uh, Bahama Pirates. Um, uh, Scott and I, we were supposed to be doing an assessment of uh, the Great Abaco Pirate population after Dorian, but. Uh, given the COVID-19 situation, we were not able to do so. So a lot of what you will see here regarding uh, the great abaco population uh, is very much uh, uh, based on monitoring and, and, and modeling uh, of these populations. Um, 
Uh, given that, I also wanted to uh, compare uh, pirate populations from four islands. So um, um, that's why I included the Cayman Islands here. So anyways, the objectives. Um, very much, uh, the first one is to estimate abundance and rate of change in abundance uh, before uh, uh, and after major hurricanes, uh, accounting for changes in detection probability, which in this case has two components. Um, second, generate parameter posterior distributions for uh, population parameters. This uh, R max means uh, the maximum population growth rate of, um, that we can have, uh, and K is the carrying capacity. Uh, two very important population parameters that I will be talking a little bit more later on, particularly our max. Uh, and um, I, we also wanted to use this uh, monitoring and modeling approaches that, that uh, we'll be talking about later on to make abundance predictions between 2020 and 2030, accounting for human induced mortality. This could be from hunting, this could be from uh, poaching, this could be from um, Road kills, uh, pirates are sometimes killed by cars and things like that, that uh, will add to that mortality M. And last but not least, uh, we wanted to model um, population dynamics uh, and the responses of these populations to major hurricanes in the Bahamas and Cayman Islands. Um, in regards to uh, key biodiversity areas, which is the subject matter, um, Basically, the rose-throated or Cuban parrot, which is commonly known like that, uh, is very much comprised by six extant populations um, that are pointed there by their arrows. Uh, and actually, from those six populations, five of them have been uh, classified as phylogenetic species, meaning that they are unique, unique conservation uh, units that we have in these islands, and therefore, uh, an important component element of um, these key biodiversity areas that we have uh, in the Bahamas, uh, particularly in the case of uh, uh, the great, um, the Bahama parrot, um, well, great adult and great in our world, of course. Um, um, basically, as the, probably has been mentioned before, unfortunately, the, the intensity and frequency and duration of major hurricanes is increasing uh, as a result of global warming. So basically, as our Caribbean waters are warming up, um, uh, we have been seeing this trend. Um, very much when I say major hurricanes, I mean in the Safford uh, Simpson uh, categories three to five, um, wind speed above 110 miles per hour, barometric pressure below 965 millibars. Uh, hurricane season, as we all know, is running right now from June to November. Uh, with a peak in September. Um, fortunately, some hurricanes now are happening even as late as December, like Otto. Uh, at any rate, um, um, and the, the intensity of these hurricanes is increasing. So who knows what we will have to do with the Saffir Simpson scale and, uh, and all that, you know, as the years pass. But anyways, uh, for the moment being, major hurricanes have direct and indirect effects on their uh, populations. And the first and most important is the structural vegetation damage. So basically structural vegetation damage leads to food limitation, which in itself leads to a, a decrease in survival and reproduction, and therefore a population response that might be a decline or might be no response, meaning the population resists and remain unchanged, um, statistically speaking, or even increase. Um, so anyways, the, this is the kind of uh, work uh, that I will be showing you guys later on in the graphs uh, in terms of how the populations are responding to uh, the direct impact of major hurricanes. We're concerned here with the direct impact of major hurricanes and uh, the direct and indirect effects. Uh, just as a matter of in, uh, background here, in terms of uh, name storms and hurricanes, uh, we can see that we have um, an average of about 15 named storms per year in the Atlantic region. Um, um, and uh, about nine of, uh, of those 15 become hurricanes and about five of those nine become major ones with very few uh, of those making um, you know, direct landfall uh, um, in the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands. But when they happen, they happen. And, uh, um, 
the frequency of that uh, some, in some years, for example, is quite heavy. For example, 2004, um, Abacot had Francis and Jane they very much hitting back to back. Uh, fortunately, uh, although they created devastation in terms of human uh, you know, property and things like that, in terms of the pirates, as you will see, they were not uh, um, uh, that bad. But basically, uh, uh, again, uh, we have uh, hurricanes like Ivan and Ike in 2004 and 2008, uh, hitting Grand Cayman and Inagua. And then Cayman Brack was last hit by Paloma. Uh, that was a late hurricane in November 2008. Inagua was hit very badly by uh, Ike, and, uh, and uh, that, that is the main hurricane uh, um, uh, that has uh, impacted the population, as you will see. Uh, we expect later damage uh, or later impact from hurricanes like, like um, Matthew and, and, and Irma, which later uh, brush or near, near touch uh, uh, great in our world. Um, as I mentioned, basically, again, the intensity of these hurricanes are increasing and the frequency uh, and the duration. I mean, just, just the history of Dorian. I mean, basically, it was in the oceans from a tropical depression on the 24th of August, uh, 2019. I mean, it lasted 14 days almost, uh, you know, very much active through the region. Uh, um, and unfortunately it made direct, you know, landfall directly hit um, uh, Abaco with winds of 185 miles per hour. By the way, the only hurricane um, uh, category five that has hit the Bahama Island since 1871 that we have records and it was devastating, as we all know. Uh, when hurricanes like that happen, well, uh, that's me in the left uh, in Cayman Brac after Hurricane Paloma. Um, vegetation is very much destroyed and, uh, and it has a long lasting effect, particularly for birds like parrots, which are frugivores. And the right one is Bahama parrots in Great Inagua after Ike. So, very much the same situation is expected, uh, for example, after Dorian for Great Abaco uh, and the direct effect of the vegetation uh, and the indirect effect of food limitation uh, are very much impacting the population through uh, starvation. Uh, in terms of population response, very much I will center on what we call in the ecological jargon um, stability. Uh, resistance and resilience. And basically, uh, I'm interested in three basic questions here. Did abundance decline significantly after the hurricane? And if did, if it did, uh, did abundance return to pre-hurricane levels? Uh, um, and, and if it did, uh, then how fast? Um, so basically for that rate of change, that R and R max, which is the maximum rate of change when when conditions become optimal again at low density are very, very important parameters to estimate from the monitoring data and the modeling uh, uh, approaches that we have. Um, very briefly, uh, this is our the survey regions in each of the four islands and the number of points that we survey per year. Uh, in some years, we're able to do pre-reproduction and post-reproduction surveys. Um, the data that I use for the modeling that you will see later on is all in uh, uh, regards to pre-reproduction surveys. Uh, um, and uh, here you go, these are, are the points, uh, Great Inawa, which is um, very inaccessible. So we venture deep, deep, deep into the bush uh, uh, at random points. And then we follow uh, uh, very much um, up to the interior and then come back. Uh, at any rate, uh, you can see that in comparison to uh, uh, um, Abaco, the southern part of Abaco and central Abaco, which are more accessible. Um, so, um, and um, here you go with uh, Grand Cayman uh, at the left and Cayman Brack uh, at the right, um, which by the way are very, very small islands uh, as you can see from, from uh, the area that is surveyed um, in relation to, to the Bahamas. All right, so for monitoring and modeling, and I will not go in uh, any depth in this, basically I'm, for that I'm referring you guys to these publications. Uh, or any questions that you may have, you can send me an email and I'll be gladly uh, to reply as soon as possible.
But anyway, we have been doing repeated point count distance sampling, which is a combination of methods. And then we have used that information, that monitoring data, that survey uh, data, we have been using that to, to develop a Bayesian state space logistic model. Uh, again, this is kind of like the estimators that are behind the distance sampling part from which we are estimating density, number of animals per hectare, population size will be the extrapolation or the inference of that density to the area. And all that is corrected for changes in detection probability, which are related to detectability of the power and availability of the power. I will leave it at that. I will not go into any depth uh, with that right now. Uh, the Bayesian state space logistic model uh, is very much well, basic logistic model, but in this case, basically, we're trying to estimate our max, uh, the maximum population growth rate um, and population carrying capacity, accounting for human induced mortality. And of course, we're very interested in, uh, in the prediction uh, um, that we're making, the forecast that we're making from these models. So therefore, in these models, we're accounting for observation and, from, uh, and for uh, process error variance. Here is the first one. So basically, in red, you will see what the model is saying. In blue, you will see what surveys are saying. Um, this is the great in our power population dynamics uh, in terms of uh, abundance. Uh, and you will see that uh, after I, uh, we had a severe decline that was a significant decline. The average uh, of, uh, was uh, minus 56%. Uh, and the population very much stay low for, for at least two years. Unfortunately, um, Ike um, happened at the same time that Great Inawa was undergoing a, a drought for two years in 2008, 2009. So the pirate population there had a double, double warmer, if you will. Uh, um, in, in, in years in which you only have drought, the pirate is very resilient to, to drought. They're really adapted to it. Uh, and actually, they are adapted to hurricanes too. But uh, again, you can see the massive mortality that happens. Uh, with a catastrophic event like that. As you can see clearly from the graph, uh, uh, the power of population uh, was done um, decline after the hurricane and it came back basically to a pre-hurricane level. Um, that is thanks to a very, very uh, um, high for a power, uh, higher max. So when these populations are at lower levels, they tend to increase uh, very rapidly and they can have a double time uh, um, a double time uh, of three years with a 95% credible intel of two to six years in which they can double their population sizes after a, a decline. And then they can, uh, on average, for the great Nawa para, a return time of like four years, uh, somewhere between two and nine or with 95% uh, probability uh, in terms of returning to pre-hurricane levels. Um, this is great Abaco, uh, before Durian. I just wanted to model this before Durian. The um, picture in great Abaco is a little bit more complicated in the sense that, for example, in 2004, um, we had hurricanes uh, Francis and Jean. Um, the power population did not decline uh, much after that. They dispersed and, and they were uh, really hard to survey for a while, but basically they, they, they were out there trying to find food. Um, and they came back uh, uh, next, you know, 2006, 2007, they were already on the, on the increase. Also in 2007, we started, uh, BNP uh, started uh, cat removal uh, efforts. So basically uh, the pirate um, uh, population was uh, not only uh, increasing by the sheer uh, capacity that it has through uh, the adaptations it has uh, uh, to living in, in these kind of uh, environments, but it also had the help of uh, uh, a better um, um, survival and, and, uh, and reproduction through the cat removal effort that we had. Um, here again, Dorian, this is all model-based. We have not done a survey, uh, but very much uh, um, to different modeling uh, approaches uh, here, we can more or less uh, have what would be a good case, uh, a me, uh, medium case uh, or moderate case and a worst case scenario. Um, right now, it seems that 
if we have something like from a moderate to a worst case scenario, this population at least will probably decline by 49%. Uh, we will have to see that. Hopefully this, uh, we will be able to survey this population very soon, uh, uh, soon as situations improve enough so we can spend our time there. Uh, um, the R max of this population is a little bit low, lower than the, than the great in Iowa population, but uh, they overlap quite a bit. Uh, double time, they can double their, their population sizes in five years um, with a credible interval of somewhere between three and seven years. They can return to pre-hurricane levels very much in seven years on average. Uh, actually, that's the median. Uh, and somewhere between four and 10, that will be the 95% uh, credible interval. In comparison to, uh, uh, this is Grand Cayman Parrot after Hurricane Ivan, which declined by 54%, you can see very much the same, very much kind of like the same um, pattern in these populations. They, they decline significantly uh, after a catastrophic event like that, and then they, they, they make their way um, slowly but surely back to uh, pre-hurricane levels. These are the R max and the, different statistics that I am showing there for this. Uh, this is all model-based, uh, based on the monitoring data we have. Um, and you can see that double time there is like four years um, with a 95% credible until somewhere between two and 11 years. Uh, return time is about six years, uh, again, anywhere between three and 16 years. Time and Brack Parrot population is the smallest of these uh, four population. It's really, although IUCN has not them, um, you know, as critically in danger, I mean, at least locally speaking, I mean, these are, again, conservation units, phylogenetic species. Uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of all the researchers like I, I mean, very much these populations are, are in danger or threatened, highly threatened. And in the case of the uh, Cayman Brack uh, Pyra is a very small population, but a very small number of breeders. At any rate, uh, you can see the same pattern with a bit more uncertainty, as you can see from the um, from the width of uh, of of the modeling uh, uh, of the modeling, which is in red. You can see that there is more uncertainty in the predictions that we're making out into the future up to 2030. But again, the same thing: the Pyra population decline again, something like what we expect from. Uh, um, uh, Dorian in the case of Great Abaco by about 49%. And then uh, it came back to pre-hurricane levels. Um, um, you can see that in this case, our max is very high, but we have uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty about it. Uh, and uh, uh, a double time in this case uh, was about three uh, years, but because of that uncertainty, uh, it could be that this spiral can be, you know, Double, double, doubling its size between two and 24 years. So in that case, the model is not that, you know, not that good in terms of predicting double time. Although the patterns are very, very similar uh, to what we have seen in the other populations. And then a return time of about four years on average, uh, with anywhere between two and 35 years. Again, very small number of breeders uh, uh, for, for such a small population. Um, uh, in conclusion, um, in terms of stability, uh, we saw from the, from the modeling and the monitoring that we have been doing that the populations do tend to return to pre-hurricane levels. So very much um, um, they show that they can come back to that pre, uh, what we call an equilibrium state uh, and local stability from a population ecology viewpoint. Uh, um, it takes some time, uh, but they can do it. Uh, they also they also show resistance. Uh, you can, as you saw from the graphs, truly they you know for small hurricanes and storms, you know one and two they 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 tend to resist and they tend to resist up to like hurricanes three. Like even in the case of back to back hurricanes, like in the case of uh, Francis and Jane in um, in Abaco back in two thousand and four, the power population there you know was able to resist very well and and kept on track. And then they show resiliency for a power population. Again, their high life history characteristics, you know, they are slow reproduction, uh, but they have a, a life, life, uh, a long lifespan and, and high survival rates. So basically for, for, 
or a para, you know, they, they show that they can be resilient and they can double their sales on average in about three years. Uh, and they can return uh, to pre-hurricane levels in about five years on average. So two basic recommendations um, in terms of uh, the monitoring that we're doing for the four islands. We, as much as we can, and again, the funding and, and uh, your resources, you know, are always in short supply, but as much as we can, we should do uh, pre-reproduction and post-reproduction surveys every other year. Uh, that way we can combine islands, say, Abaco one year, Inawa the other. Uh, but the reason for that is that, you know, with, with surveys done twice a year like this, I mean, we can uh, make models that are more explicit uh, in terms of the mechanisms, in, in, in terms of birth and death, uh, because these are close populations to, um, to immigrants and immigrants. Uh, and number four, the great Abaco population, which is really a high concern right now after such a devastating hurricane, we were not able to survey that population. We, we were going to try in April 2020, but that was not possible because of COVID-19. So we should be shooting for October 2020, if possible. And if not, then April 2021, you know, so, so we, can, we can make an assessment of the status of this population as soon as possible. And by all means, the cat removal should continue as much as possible at nesting areas, at least for the next five years while we're studying how this population recover from what probably will be a very significant decline. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for all your help and, uh, and uh, Jane in, in, in the Cayman Islands also have been working with me for many years. So anyway, thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, thank you very much. So I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, one of our first questions is uh, directed at Janine. And one of the questions was, what is the pixel size of the mapping images um, that were used to map the habitat of the Bahama Oriole? Um, and I guess you could also follow up maybe with how you would use that map to relate to key biodiversity areas or maybe direct, you know, which, which sites you think would be good to conserve and why maybe. Yeah, so the pixels are 30 by 30 meters, so that's actually pretty high resolution. Um, and yeah, so with regards to how you could use that to kind of target areas for uh, biodiversity, so maybe you would want to consider, so I talked a lot about the Bahama Oriole, right, but there's other species that, you know, use different habitats. So like I know I've been with Scott while he's been surveying for his Kirtland's warblers down on South Andros and that sort of scrubbier habitat. So I guess sort of... Um, identifying areas where, um, you know, many species kind of could overlap, um, that could potentially be a area worth, you know, preserving, because that'll have a higher proportion of biodiversity, I suppose. Um, so yeah, just outside of the pine forest, you could use this for those other types of habitats. Um, and then someone had asked about too, about expanding it to include, um, you know, Abaco or Grand Bahama. So that's certainly something we've talked about doing. And theoretically right now, I think I could just go in and uh, expand the map to include those two islands. Maybe I would want to get a few more training data just to improve the accuracy. Um, I'm not quite sure how accurate it would be if I just went in to predict habitats on Abaco and Grand Bahama, but that is something we were looking at in future uh, directions. Um, yeah, was there anything else you wanted me to add on to? Uh, not just yet. Uh, thank okay. you for a pretty comprehensive answer. Um, we, we had another question. I think this is directed towards, uh, Frank. What about raccoons in Abaco? I live in Eleuthera and they've had a tremendous impact on biodiversity here after being introduced about 20 years ago. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Because I, 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 um, you were asking about raccoons. I, I was not able to hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll repeat it. What about raccoons in Abaco? I live in Eleuthera and they've had a tremendous impact on biodiversity here after being introduced about 20 years ago. Um, uh, yeah, uh, raccoons um, uh, in Abaco, um, again, they, they have their impact um, directly to the para. Uh, as far as we know, they have not been as bad uh, as cats. Uh, I don't think we have recorded any 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 event of predation, and, and probably Caroline Stahala is the best uh, one to ask this one because she has been working with the breeding part of, uh, of this population more than I. 
for many, many years. But anyways, I don't think uh, we, we have any event recorder of, uh, of um, raccoons, although they are present uh, um, near uh, the pirate nesting areas. And, you know, we have been observing tracks, for example, as far north, uh, I mean, south as uh, Crossing Rocks and places like that. But uh, myself, uh, you know, I've been in that island so many, many times. I'm doing all those points. I've, I have to say that, that, that um, you know, somehow they have not been able to uh, populate the southern part of, of Great Epic. We were really afraid that they would have done so. And that's actually, that's why um, Eric back in 2002, 2001 contacted me to start working in, in, in Abaco just to see because, because people were, were afraid that, that the, the, the raccoon would be uh, adding to the problems that the power already had with cats. But um, uh, I have to say that as far as I know, I don't think that's the problem. And actually the population, uh, as you can see from the, the monitoring and the modeling, uh, before the hurricane was doing very well. A positive increase, it was on a, on a significant positive trend. Um, so at least regarding the population of pirates in Great Abaco, we, you know, and raccoons, we, we, we were not, or we are not that concerned. Okay, thank you, Frank. <clears throat> um, we have a question for Penny, and that also that question also is directed at the BNT a bit. Uh, I understand that there's an undertaking to update the KBAs in the Bahamas. Are there any areas in particular that are being looked at so far? Um, Penny, would you like to answer this one? Sure, I'll start and then hand it over to you, Bradley. Um, thank you for that question. Just to kind of tie together the two previous presentations with, with um, the, the first one. I didn't have time to mention that KBAs are um, identified based on the confirmed presence of one or more species at threshold numbers. So the kinds of data that were just presented in the last two presentations are extremely helpful for not only evaluating whether or not um, a site meets the criteria, but also for delineating, making sure that the boundaries um, include the, the right habitat. In terms of um, areas that are being looked at in particular for the update of KBAs in the Bahamas, so as I mentioned, there has been quite a bit of work done already, and we want to make sure to build on um, that work. As part first, um, as part of the ecosystem profiling process in 2018, 2019, um, work led by BirdLife International in collaboration with BNT identified a number of sites that have sufficient data to demonstrate that they meet the KBA criteria and a bunch of additional sites that seem very likely to, but there aren't quite enough data yet, or the team wasn't able to compile it in the time frame of the project. Um, just in terms of, of those sites, building on that work, we'd like to start there and make sure that all of those sites that we think are going to meet the KBA criteria are properly evaluated and the right information compiled to show that they do. And then to identify additional sites as needed, focusing on those species first that are globally threatened and endemic or near endemic to the Bahamas as a way to prioritize the work. The Bahamas obviously has a lot of globally threatened species as well as a lot of endemic species that either haven't yet been assessed for the red list or have and may not be threatened, but they're geographically restricted. So it could take quite a while to work through all the species and we wanna make sure that those threatened endemics get um, looked at first. And just in uh, a couple of days of being together early in March, we identified a number of species and areas that definitely have, have need to be recognized as KBAs, but haven't in any of the previous processes. But perhaps Bradley, you could elaborate on any specific areas that you're looking at. Yes, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, Bradley, I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but, but I, had a, I had a comment regarding regarding uh, Southern and Central Abaco. I think, um, uh, I mean, I think they should be added uh, as, uh, and expanded very much in terms of key biodiversity areas. Uh, the COP is, um, is so, so important uh, for the parrot um, outside the breeding season and actually during the breeding season too, but mostly outside the breeding season um, that, um, you know, basically I don't think the parrot would be doing 
that well if it was not for uh, the amount of copies that still exist um, uh, between South and Central Abaco. So Baymarsh South, the whole Southern part of Abaco and Central Abaco are of key importance for the parrot, which is, by the way, as I mentioned, a phylogenetic species. It's a very unique, you know, biodiversity element in this in these islands. Um, so anyway, just wanted to add that. Um, so one thing that we might talk about is, you know, the status of the Bahama parrot in that it is a, it's classified as the Cuban Amazon and how it is recognizing an individual uh, an organism as a species or having a restricted range how does that interact with uh declaring areas as key biodiversity areas and could you please tell us a little bit more about the differences between the populations of bahama parrots frank so is that directly uh, directed to me or to penny you uh, initially as well as penny please uh anyone can answer really all right so penny if you don't mind i'll start and then uh, you follow sure. up Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so yeah, um, uh, basically, uh, and that's why I, I cited uh, there uh, the work of Russello at all 2010. Uh, and I can send you um, anybody that is interested, I can send you a PDF of that publication. Um, and other uh, publications that, you know, very much have shown um, that these are very unique, um, genetically speaking, you know, from a phylogenetic viewpoint. They're unique conservation units, uh, biodiversity units. Um, very, very, um, um, you know, because of geographic isolation, they are they have become quite different in terms of uh, of uh, not only their genetics but basically their behaviors. Uh, and um, and for example, the abaco parrot is the only one of all of them that is a, a you know nest on the ground. Just to give you one, you know. Um, so, so in that regard, um, um, I would say that the Cuban parrot is a misnomer. Um, I, actually, I favor, uh, and I have um, uh, in this um, regard, I'm in, um, in agreement with Brussello at all. What we have is uh, five different uh, phylogenetic species. Therefore, um, what we call Bahama parrot is really the great abaco parrot and the great Inawa parrot. Um, and the same for the Cayman Islands. We have the Cayman Brack Parrot and the Grand Cayman Parrot. And the Cuban Parrot, basically, well, um, the subspecies Leucocephala uh, and, and Palmarin, they're, they're, they were not distinguishable enough. So basically, uh, that's why uh, from the six populations, we only have five phylogenetic species. But again, bottom line, the Great Abaco and the Great Inawa power populations are quite unique. They're, they're um, quite unique in terms of their ecologies and in terms of their evolution, which is happening as we speak. Okay. Uh, can I just follow up, Bradley? And also there's a question about the guidelines for KBAs um, that you might want to touch on as, as well sure. in your response. Uh, yep. So with respect to um, the Amazon, that species is near threatened, so it wouldn't trigger um, the KBA criteria for threatened species unless it was recognized, each population was recognized as its own species. But fortunately, in this case, the Bahamas populations are so large that the species is extremely likely to trigger the geographically restricted criterion, which um, requires 10% of the global population to be at a site. The threatened species criteria, the thresholds for those are, are quite a bit lower. Um, but for, for species that are not globally threatened, um, but are geographically restricted, they could still qualify as, as a global KBA. Of course, if those species get split and they're reassessed, um, they could certainly uh, trigger in, in their own right. Um, in terms of the genetic uniqueness of those uh, populations in the Bahamas, um, the, as I mentioned in one of my first slides, the criteria also consider genetic diversity through a couple of the species-based criteria. So if the, if the um, populations hold a threshold proportion of the species genetic diversity, it could also qualify. So there, I think that it's um, pretty safe that these sites will, will trigger under the KBA standard. In terms of um, the other questions in the chat, one of them was, do a number of species have to be included for a site to qualify as a KBA? The answer is no. Um, a site needs to meet one criteria for one element of biodiversity to qualify. That said, most sites have 
multiple biodiversity elements triggering them as, as KBAs, but it can be identified just for one species if it, if it meets the thresholds and criteria. And in terms of guidelines for proposing an area, um, those are available on the KBA website, keybiodiversityareas.org. There are two main documents in addition to the global standard. One is the guidelines for applying the KBA criteria, which goes into much more depth on kind of the technical side and the explanations of how to apply the criteria. And then there's another document that goes through more the process side of things. How would you, once you have all the data, kind of how do you compile it and to whom do you send it and what form do you use and what are the minimum required documentation standards? So I'd be happy to send those after the call or you can find them on the KBA website. Thank you for that response, Penny. Mm -hmm. I think that we have covered most of our questions. Um, and so this brings our, our panel to a conclusion. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day and, and tune in next week for the next edition of uh, Bahamas Natural History Conference Virtual Edition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening.